finished this slide, and I was like, and I know there wasn't much left, but I want to, I figured about 10 minutes of this lecture left. So another fungal disease uh, that causes issues. Again, it's not super, super common. And really, there is a specific group of individuals that it seems to target. It's called Sporothrix shankii. Uh, it really only causes issues on the arms and legs. This fungus is found in soil and plant material. And it gets in the body if you are actively working with soil or with plants that may now have some of the spores on it, and you have an open wound. So this particular fungal spore has to get into an open wound. Now, the biggest, so I'm like, people that are huge gardeners and have open wounds are at a high risk for it, but people that grow roses are at the highest risk for it. Why roses? Yeah, they have, oh, they're working in the soil, they're working with plants, and because they are working with a plant that has thorns, they're probably gonna have open lesions from little scratches. So this fungal spore can get in, and right at the infection site, it's going to cause a lesion. It's like, all right, well, it's fine. But it does like to travel. Once it gets in the body, it gets into the lymphatic system. And as it travels along the lymphatic vessel, everywhere there is an enlarged lymph node, it will cause another lesion. So you can actually see, like, the infection site, and then we start to see active lesions right in a line as it travels the lymphatic vessels and it travels the lymph, the lymph nodes. So it causes those secondary lesions anywhere where there are lymph nodes. It is not deadly. It's more of annoying than anything else. It's going to be painful. It is treatable. We do have some antifungals. Usually it's an oral antifungal that treats at the infection sites, that treats at the, where those lesions are. And then your immune system generally kicks in and does everything else. Those that have no immune system, they'd have to take an oral antifungal. Diagnosing it, the fungus is dimorphic, which means what it looks like in the body is going to be slightly different than what it looks like in the soil. But treating is usually just some type of topical. Another issue we have with fungus is we went over lots of different fungus that can cause disease. They get in the body, they cause issues, lots of different areas in the body. But fungi are also a top cause of allergies. I'd say about 10% of people that suffer from allergies, even seasonal allergies, it's caused by fungal spores. As they get into the body, whether you're outside or whether they're in buildings, they get in the body and they cause what they call as type 1 hypersensitivity. These are your typical allergy symptoms. You might have some asthma, difficult breathing, maybe you have some eczema, some skin issues, um, or hay fever, that runny nose, watery eyes. Um, allergies. Again, is your immune system just recognizes that as a foreign body as it should, and it just overreacts a little bit. Hypersensitivity, this is what it can actually cause allergic, um, like severe allergic reactions, way less common. This is when people can go into anaphylactic shock. Super, super rare. Probably would have discovered that way earlier. Out with allergy reports, like in the news all the time, they're like, and this is your daily allergy report. They'll sit there and be like, oh, these are the pollen counts, these are the spore counts. Like they'll tell you, you know, is it fungal issues that's going to cause some of those allergies? Is it not? Usually a week or two, that week right after like a nice big rainfall, those spore counts are going to go up. Those fungi are just oh so happy. And then you start to suffer from more <laughs> uh, allergy type symptoms. I was going to say, we're now in the type of the year that we generally don't get allergy reports um, in the news, but in the spring and in the summer and the fall, we usually do. Mushrooms to talk about. These are not ones that generally cause a disease, but these are mushrooms that will kill you. So they're fungus that will kill you. So these are the three most deadly mushrooms that we have. Um, the ones called Amanita phalloids also known as the death cap mushroom, that if you ingest it, um, it destroys your liver and it generally kills you within about two days. Another one called the gyromitra esculenta. It's also nicknamed the false morel. Does anyone go morel hunting or eat morels? I've only gone morel. I'm not very good at it. Um, so this is what a normal morel looks like. It's cream colored, it's got this variegated look to it. 
And for those that have eaten or uh, hunted morels, if you open them up, what do they look like on the inside? They're completely hollow. Um, and so they don't weigh very much whatsoever. They're completely hollow. That's a normal morel, super good. Throw in some butter and everything tastes good. A false usually a little bit more darker red color, sometimes not even quite that dark. Um, and it still has that variegated look to it. So for people that don't know that there is something other than a normal morel, may look at that and be like, oh, well, that's cool morel. That one's just a colorful one. Um, and they might eat it. Um, the biggest difference other than just the coloring is that if we open this up on the inside, it is solid. Um, that one you know for sure. It's not just a regular morel that's different colors because regular morels don't turn colors. Um, if eaten, it will also kill you. It causes complete liver failure. You're probably going to have bloody diarrhea, and you're usually dead within a few days. Don't eat them. Um, the last one, Cortinarius gentilis, are these little brown mushrooms. Um, they usually take a little bit longer than two days. It's usually about three to seven days as it starts to break down, not just the liver, but it starts to cause other organ failure. Also very deadly. So I left my little sign that I found somewhere online, you know, all mushrooms are edible, some only once, and then you're done. Last group of mushrooms, these are not ones that generally kill you, but they, these are the hallucinogenic mushrooms. The biggest issues is they can cause abdominal problems, they can cause diarrhea, they can cause liver damage, um, especially in large quantities. In children, they can cause convulsions. So these are things that you still may see patients that come in after eating too many of them. This is the more common uh, mushroom that causes hallucinations. So that when people say, oh, I took some shrooms, it is most likely this one. You know, random fact, it is grown um, on cow manure. It's the only way that it grows. So hopefully it was cleaned. Um, and then there's this one, the Amanita muscaria, also hallucinogenic mushroom. So these are mushrooms that, again, you may see patients that come in. Um, they're usually eaten because of hallucinations that they can cause, but if eaten too many, or especially in younger children, they can cause mushroom poisoning. Now, fun fact about this particular mushroom. This particular mushroom is also known as the Christmas mushroom. Any guess why? Maybe you're like, what's red and white? You're like, oh, it's so Christmassy. Because you'll see this mushroom everywhere now. Now that it's Christmas season, and you're going to be like, oh my God, I see it. I'm like, I found some wrapping paper the other day. Got that mushroom on it. Um, my kids were trying to pick out some flannel bedding for Christmas because they wanted some more stuff. I'm like, one of them had this. I'm like, come on, pick that one. Um, it's known as the Christmas mushroom. Most people it's red and white. Oh, you would think so. Um, however, legend goes. It was someone that had taken and consumed a large amount of this particular hallucinogenic mushroom um, and envisioned seeing someone that wore red and white. And who would that be? Santa. And so envision and the idea of that where Santa came from, that originated from, is it was someone that was shrooming and that's where Santa came from. And so I'm like, you see this mushroom everywhere, because again, it's like Christmas. It's like there's Santa on his little mushroom. You can get ornaments of this particular mushroom. And I don't think I have it on this PowerPoint. I've got another one. Um, I'll include the link on Blackboard. There is a link on there. I mean, if you type in like red and white mushroom and Christmas and Santa, um, I've got an article that's like, this is the article that says, this is the reason why Santa, you know, where Santa came from, and it's the hallucinogenic mushroom. I think it was like a monk or someone like that had, that had come up with this whole idea of Santa because they were shrooming on this particular mushroom. You know, so fun fact at Christmas time with the family um, is that that's where Santa came from, someone that was shrooming. I am. I was so excited when I saw them and I was like, I get to wear my mushroom. I get to wear it once a year. <laughs> you would think so, but I think corporation made Rudolph but not Santa, just someone on shrooms. All right, our last PowerPoint, last, last one. <coughs> um, we won't finish it today, there's no way. Um, we'll finish it on Wednesday, so we'll just see how far we can get to today. And it's all the parasites. So just kind of like the 
Uh, bacteria and viruses, there's a bunch of them, and so, you know, I group them kind of based on, well, we'll get into it, but I'm like, a lot of it's based on structures and looks, um, on how we group these different parasites. Diseases, I mean, we can find a parasite pretty much any country, any um, continent in the entire world. There are parasitic diseases. Uh, we group our parasitic diseases into protozoan parasites and our helminthic parasites. So that's why even on your little sheets, you've got a whole left side of your little sheet. Those are the parasitic protozoans. Everything on the right side of the sheet are the parasitic helminths. The biggest differences between them, the parasitic protozoans that are on the left side of your sheet, those are all single-celled organisms, so super, super tiny. But they are parasites, they're not a fungus, they're not a bacteria. Like they are their own single eukaryotic organism. It's pretty advanced considering it's only one cell. Uh, everything on the right-hand side are helminths, and helminths means worms. So these are all going to be the parasitic worm infections. Now, we generally see more parasitic diseases in rural, undeveloped, and overcrowded places. Again, rural, usually you're out into areas where um, maybe water treatment isn't as good. People are working in the soil, ingesting soil. Um, a lot of these are from ingesting soil. Um, overcrowded places, again, it just gets into certain areas and it can spread. Undeveloped, again, water treatments are not wonderful. Um, but that does not mean at all that, oh, well, I live in the city. <laughs> I'll never get anything. We'll talk about some that are super, super common. Um, and one that even, you know, had the biggest outbreak in the whole world in Milwaukee. Uh, most of the parasites, I say most, a lot of the parasites generally have two hosts, if not more, that they have to get into. The definitive host is the one where they grow to full size and reproduction. Definitive host, they have to go through sometimes multiple intermediate hosts. It's like in each host they get into, they develop just a little bit more. It's not until they get to do the definitive host that they're now like an adult, they are reproducing. So some of them have very complex life cycles as they have to get into all these very, very specific intermediate hosts. There are lots of different ways that we can acquire parasitic infections. Um, some can get in through the skin, in through the eyes. Some are spread by different insects. Some just can get, um, let's see, there's the skin, there's the eyes. Um, some get inhaled. Some are fecal oral, again, you're eating poo. Um, and then some are also sexually transmitted. I think we're going to go, all the ones that are listed up there, we'll get through. This is what you guys have, but mine's colorful. Um, so again, we're going to start with the parasitic protozoans, and because I like to be somewhat ordered, we're going to start at the top left and work our way all the way around. Um, and again, we'll see how far we get through today. So we're going to start with the parasitic protozoans. Again, they're all single-celled organisms, so they are unicellular, but they are still eukaryotes, so they're still an advanced cell. They're not a prokaryote like a bacteria is. That's very simple. They don't even have a nucleus. These are still pretty advanced cells, especially for how well, they get places. Now, most of them are ingested, but there are two different forms that parasitic protozoans uh, can be in. Uh, there's like different stages depending on where we find them. One is called the trophozoite. It is the feeding and reproducing stage of these different protozoans. So it's almost like the adult version, where it's like actively reproducing, it's actively eating. Those are the ones that are going to be inside of you, just you know, feeding away and reproducing. But there's also another form called the cyst form. This is like the dormant form, like out in the soil, out in water supplies, where it's not doing anything. It's just sitting there waiting to get ingested by a host. This is what's known as the infective form meaning it's the form that you drink or eat, and then you get infected with it. It's almost just like the dormant version, because it's not reproducing, it's not feeding at that stage. Now, because there are so many protozoans, the way we do group them, which is why the four different boxes, is 
how do they move? So we have one group that moves because it has cilia. We've got another group that moves in an, in an amoeboid fashion, and it just kind of oozes. We've got another group that has flagella, and we have another group, they're called apicomplex apicomplexins, and that just means they have some complex structure that allows them to move. Right, there's the four boxes. So we're gonna start with our first box at the very top, the ones that have cilia, and if you notice on there, there's only one. So there's only one ciliated protozoan that causes issues with humans. There's lots of other ciliated protozoans out there, but there's only one that causes issues with um, humans. We only see the cilia in the trophozoite stage. So the cyst stage where it's hanging out in the environment is not swimming around. It's only once it's inside of us that it develops that cilia. And the only one that does cause us issues is Ballantidium coli. Now, based on its name, the coli, just like E. coli, this is an intestinally found bacteria because the coli is for the colon. And so this particular parasite is usually found in animal intestinal tracts. We pick it up by ingesting contaminated food and water, which means what did you just eat or drink? You just ate or drank some poop. And in that poop was one of the cyst stages of this particular parasite. Now, if you are healthy, you're almost always asymptomatic. No issues whatsoever. However, those that have a poor health, already you know, succumbed to something else, those are definitely you know, ones that are in the age stage of HIV infections. This particular parasite's gonna give the intestinal tract. It's gonna kinda run rampant because no immune system is taking care of it. And it usually causes persistent diarrhea. Like this is not, this is months, months long of diarrhea possibly blood and mucus, I spelled mucus wrong, um, in the diarrhea, abdominal pain, and weight loss. I mean, you got diarrhea for months. You're probably going to have some weight loss that goes along with it. We do have some antiprotozoan drugs. And they work best if you already have some immune system. Our second group of protozoans are the ones that move in an amoeboid fashion. And there are three of them. The two of them even have the word amoeba in it to tell you that it moves in an amoeba type fashion. And so, oh, my little video links work. Um, I just had a little video that just showed them oozing. Um, they don't have any truly defined shape because they truly just move kind of by oozing around. So they'll send out these kind of little pseudopods and just ooze wherever they need to go. So they're usually tied to a watery type environment. There are only a few, there's tons of amoeba out there that live in water. Only a few actually cause disease. The problem is some of the diseases they cause are extremely deadly. Otherwise, lots of amoeba. If you ever take some pond water, look underneath the microscope and you see some of these little oozing guys, most likely not one of these guys. The first amoeba that causes disease, its name is entamoeba. Again, enta for like enteric or intestinal, so it's like an, it's an intestinal amoeba. It's found in the digestive tracts of humans. It is more commonly found in less developed countries. And it's picked up by drinking contaminated water. AKA you're drinking uh, feces in that water. So developed or less developed countries that don't have proper sewage treatment, it puts you at a higher risk of picking it up. Now, if you pick up this particular parasite, especially if you travel somewhere, um, there are three different types of amoebiasis, that's the disease of this particular amoeba, um, that you could develop. The first one's called luminal amoebiasis, which just means it stays in the lumen or the middle part of the intestine. It's not invading the intestine, it just stays in the intestinal tract, it doesn't go anywhere else. And generally, it's asymptomatic, which means you're a carrier of it. But again, unless someone drinks your feces or eats your feces, you're fine. You know, just have this luminal amoebiasis. 
If it starts to invade the intestinal wall, now it's called invasive amoebic dysentery. Again, amoebic, it's an amoeba. And then the dysentery, because if it starts to invade the intestinal wall lining, what's our body's natural response to something that's irritating our intestinal walls? Um, and so this is why they call it like a dysentery. It's because that's any type of dysentery is extreme diarrhea. If super rare, but if still left, you know, uncontrolled, you know, you don't go to the doctor for this area, um, you could suffer then from invasive extra-intestinal amoebiasis. Again, the extra-intestinal just means it is now moved beyond or outside of the intestinal tract. It gets into the bloodstream, can travel around the body, and cause issues in other organs. This is where it can get deadly because it can start getting into organs like the spleen and get at organs like the liver, um, and it can cause a severe inflammation and damage to different body organs. Just drink clean water. So <laughs> don't drink water that has fecal matter in it, and then you don't have to worry about ever picking up this particular uh, parasite. It's great. Now, the other two amoeba, we kind of group them together because of the diseases that they cause are almost identical. Timing <laughs> is a little different, but otherwise the disease they cause is the same. So acanth amoeba, again, it's got the word amoeba in it, and nigleria cause rare, it's rare, it usually makes the news, rare fatal brain infections. And because they are amoeba, they are tied to water. To both natural water systems as well as artificial water systems. So natural water systems, ponds, lakes, puddles, rivers, although they really don't like that moving of the water, um, but any kind of natural water system. Artificial water systems, this could be pools, hot tubs. Um, I was going to say one of the biggest ones uh, now that it's making the news is neti pops, neti pots. Does anyone know what a neti pot is? Yeah. It's like the warm water, and you get it up in your nose in there. It cleans everything out. Well, guess that That's a water source, and usually it's warm water. Um, and these guys love it. So depending on where you get your water from, um, it puts you at an increased risk. So acanth amoeba gets into the body through any kind of cut. So if you're swimming somewhere, whether it's a pool, these can survive chlorine. It's scary. Um, so whether you're swimming in a pool, swimming in a pond, swimming in a lake, whatever, I'm like, it can get in through a cut. It can get in through the conjunctiva of the eye. And most likely, it's picked up through if you inhale. So if someone dunks you under the water and you inhale water, or if you just have a neti pot and you're inhaling the water, you are now inhaling this particular amoeba. People that use contact lenses and rinse it with tap water also puts them at a higher risk, just because you don't know where that tap water has been. I mean, the water here in La Crosse is super heavily treated. Um, people that have wells, um, Increased risk. Once this particular parasite, this amoeba, gets into the body, cut through the eye, through inhaling, it will, like it's not a, it may, it will lead to what's known as amoebic encephalitis. Again, the words of these different disorders tell you about it. So encephalitis, anything, itis is inflammation. Encephal is brain. So this is inflammation of the brain because it's amoebic, it's caused by an amoeba. So it's inflammation of the brain caused by an amoeba. Leads to death within weeks. Here it's fatal. The other, the nigleria, still very, very similar. It generally only gets in the body through inhalation. So the nigleria doesn't usually get in the body um, through cuts. Though it can get in through the conjunctiva of the eye. It also causes amoebic encephalitis, but it also will inflame the meninges, those layers around the spinal cord and around the brain as well. So it's meningoencephalitis, which is inflammation of everything that comes to the brain. It will cause hemorrhaging, coma, and usually death. Now, lucky for us, most cases of these two amoeba are found more in southern states. We still have some cases around here. The ones in Minnesota, I don't want to say it was a few years ago because it was probably like 10 now. Um, there was a water park somewhere in Minnesota um, that had some, I think two, two kids ended up. They tied it back to, they got the amoeba um, from this particular water park. 
Um, where it originated from, they don't know. Uh, but this particular amoeba obviously does not like to freeze. It can't survive freezing. That doesn't mean these things can't survive at the bottom of a lake where it doesn't freeze, but luckily for us, we're not swimming outside half the year. Um, and it doesn't like the freezing. So we have less cases here in the northern states. But generally, when there are cases, this always makes the news because it's scary. Um, there's not a ton of cases. I was looking in like the last, oh, last 60 years, there were like 100 and some cases. It ends up to be like around three cases a year. And it's not a ton, I'm not gonna look. but out of like the 160-ish cases, only four lived. So, I mean, we're talking like if you get this, it's almost guaranteed it's a death sentence. Um, and even if you did survive, you would probably have so much neurological damage from the damage that this particular amoeba did to that brain tissue when it was living there. Um, treatment, again, you know, they generally throw everything at them. It's kind of like with the rabies, it's like a death sentence. So, let's try everything and anything. The best luck they have, again, you know, four did survive, um, and some can survive for a little bit longer before they die, are generally antifungals. Even the antiprotozoans don't work against this. They've said that antifungals seem to work a little bit better against these. Either way, not fun to work with. Our next group of our protozoans are the ones that have flagella somewhere in their life cycle. Again, that cyst stage usually doesn't have the flagella but that feeding, reproducting stage does. So we're gonna go through four different uh, flagellated protozoans. So it just means they have a, fl a flagella at some point in their life cycle. And they are gonna have at least one. I mean, some have just one, some have multiple flagella. How many flagella they have and where they're located really does help us identify which protozoan it is. And these things are eukaryotic organisms. So they are not as small as bacteria, because I know bacteria can have flagella. But a bacteria, we got to magnify it a thousand times, and you're probably still not going to see the flagella. I mean, you hear a little bacteria that you see in the lab, we magnify it a thousand times, and you probably aren't going to see the uh, flagella. These guys, they're eukaryotic cells. They're a whole lot bigger. You're going to see them probably magnified at 40x, um, and you probably see these flagella really easy. They're flagellated. Protozoans is Trypanosoma cruzi. Which a lot of people have, probably haven't heard of the actual protozoan name, but you may have heard of the disease that it causes, which is known as Chagas disease. Now, the highest number of cases, Central and South America. So if you ever travel, increased risk. However, we do have cases down in Texas, um, Florida, I think Arizona, like in some of the southern States, we are seeing cases, so it's kind of working its way up. Luckily for us, up in the northern states, you know, although we hate sometimes when it's so cold, the good news is a lot of things that spread by insects don't like the cold either. So we have less things up here. How it spread is through the bite of a bug called the kissing bug. Its official name is a triatoma. And they're quite large. So even on the scale, you can see this particular bug right there. Now it likes to feed at night on your lips. It feeds on blood. And you guess why it likes your lips? Uh, super thin. I mean, that's why they dry out so fast. Um, super thin. I mean, it's like the easiest way to get blood. Your lips are red for a reason. It's because that blood is super close to the surface of the skin. And so they will feed on your lips at night, and so that's why they're called a kissing bug. Now, once it feeds on you, um, it's going to deposit, because I was like, the bug itself, or the protozoan, is developing in that particular bug, the triatoma. Once it feeds on you, you know, it's sucking blood, but it's also depositing visiting this particular parasite, and it introduces what's known as the triple mastigote, I don't care that you know it, into the bloodstream. So this particular parasite travels around in the bloodstream, and it will eventually get into this particular tissue, does it say? Could you guys guess based on you know, pictures in this tissue? You know, generally in pea tissue. It is, a, I don't know if it's it is a muscle tissue, but which one? 
because they're smooth muscle, skeletal muscle, and cardiac muscle. It's cardiac. Um, cardiac muscle tissue, mostly because it branches. Uh, it's the only one that branches like that. So this particular parasite, once it gets into the bloodstream, you got bitten by one of these things at night, it's gross. Um, it gets in there and it starts to develop in your heart, in your cardiac tissue. And from there, they look like these tiny little cysts and they are growing and they're developing and what they, when they leave the heart, they are more developed and they are then at this stage, what's known as an amastigote. And it's this one that you can actually see the flagella. So these things are then going to get released from that heart tissue, that cardiac muscle tissue, into the bloodstream. They're just going to circulate, out, circulate around in your blood, waiting for another kissing bug to ingest you, and then it will develop again, and then kisses, and then it spreads again. Um, so we only see the flagellated stage after it's left that cardiac tissue. Problem is, it's developing in the cardiac tissue. Is that good for your heart? Not at all. Um, I feel like it's on this down here. Ah, I was going to say, you can actually see, they did a blood smear. They just took a drop of blood, and you can see, these are all your red blood cells, and this is that flagellated stage. So that's a lot of them. Obviously, it's going to cause damage to the body, but the biggest issue is because it develops in that cardiac muscle tissue, the leading cause of death in Latin America is cardiac failure. It's because the damage that this particular parasite did to the heart. And it's not because they're unhealthy and they're overweight and that's why it's called causing the, cardi the, the heart failure. Um, it's because of this particular parasite that gets in there and causes damage. Now, if you do get bitten by one of these little triatoma kissing bugs, some of the things that will happen. One, you'll go through what's known as an acute stage. You're going to get a swelling at that bite site. You're going to have a big old you know, swollen area where it was biting on your uh, lip. Then, usually within about a week, you kind of get into that stage where your immune system is starting to kick in because it knows it's under a, attack. And you know, it's what's known as the generalized stage. You've got a fever, swollen lymph nodes, enlarged spleen. Again, all things that maybe you go to the doctor, maybe you don't. You're like, I don't know, I got a fever, some swollen lymph nodes. I must be just coming down with something. I've got a cold something. And for a lot of individuals, they don't go to the doctor. Um, but this thing is still living in you. And you can go into what's known as the asymptomatic chronic stage. For years, this thing is living in your body. It is reproducing in your heart. It is releasing that little flagellated thing into your bloodstream for years. But you don't have any symptoms at this stage. And then eventually, your immune system will eventually get rid of the um, flagellated stage uh, if you have an immune system. But later on, because of the damage that was done to the heart, you develop what's known as you develop congestive heart failure. So you're back into a symptomatic stage. Kind of like, well, I was fine for years. <laughs> now I have heart failure. And it's because the little cysts that those organisms formed while they were growing and developing, it destroyed the heart tissue, which I spelled tissue wrong. Any guess what your prevention could be? How would you prevent that? Um, but I don't know how much bug spray you want to put in your mouth. That thing so tastes nasty. Um, but bug nets. So a lot of people in these different countries, they use the bug nets, not just because of all the mosquitoes, because we'll get into more of those diseases that are caused by mosquitoes coming up, um, but also it prevents these guys from feeding on you at night as well. So anything to prevent you from getting eaten by these things. But bug nets at, at night, best thing that they have. Next of our flagellated organisms is Leishmania, which causes Leishmaniasis, also found in more tropical regions, so luckily not found here, but again, if you ever travel or if you've had patients that have traveled by a sand flea, that's usually found on dogs and small rodents. So it's more commonly found in patients that have interactions with dogs and rodents that usually have some type of, like, it's called a sand flea. And they have several stages as they develop these protozoans. 
The one are amastigotes. Uh, they are, this is one of our white blood cells. This is a macrophage. It's one of our eating cells. It's an immune system cell. And our immune system cells, these eating cells, their job is to eat things that shouldn't be there. Well, it ate one of these things, and guess what? They figured out how not to get broken down by the lysosome and all the enzymes that it makes, and they will sit there and just grow and grow and grow inside our own cells. It's like the most wonderful hiding place ever is if you can survive and live in our own immune system cells. Once it leaves our macrophages, our monocytes, our white blood cells, um, then they have now developed into that more advanced stage where we see the flagella, and that's sort of what are known as promastigotes. Where, where a patient was bitten by one of these little sand fleas. Again, they were, maybe there were rodents in wherever place they stayed, or they were like, oh, look at this random dog, and they got bitten by a flea. There are three clinical forms. The first is wherever those fleas were biting, you're going to have lesions um, on the skin. So you're going to have skin lesions. They say painless, but I don't know. When I look at things like that, it looks painful. Then, as this is developing and growing, they're generally going to, usually going to develop into what's known as mucocutaneous. You're still going to have lesion, lesions on the skin, but it's also going to cause lesions on your mucous membranes. Some of our top mucous membranes are inside of the lining of our nose and anywhere around our mouth. And so that's what this particular individual is suffering from. It's lesions on the skin and anywhere around those mucous membranes. Okay, it looks painful. That starts to travel throughout the body, they then call it visceral leishmaniasis. It can be deadly depending on how many are in the body and what organs it targets. It usually will cause an enlarged spleen. It can cause fever, fatigue. A lot of times it will almost resemble monotype symptoms, except for usually it's followed by that. But it can cause death if not treated because it will eventually destroy the liver, it will destroy the kidney, it can get into the lungs, it can destroy lung tissue, and this is when it becomes deadly. Most likely, if you are in a developed country, um, you can go to a healthcare facility, <laughs> they're probably gonna see something like that, and it's unlikely it will develop into the visceral leishmaniasis, if you have access to healthcare, because we do have some nice antiprotozoans that work wonderful for it. They will. Just showing that life cycle again. Generally, if you're bitten by one of those little sand flies, it's actually gonna put that flagellated stage, it looks like a big old V, with a flagella on each side into the bloodstream. Our phagocytic cells, their job is to ingest things. We want them to, however, it doesn't get broken down. And then it starts to reproduce and completely take over that entire cell, and it will start to look a little bit more like that picture. And again, it will release those, and then as long as you get bitten by another sand flea, you can sit there and constantly um, repeat that cycle over and over again. Now, because it's spread by, spread by these sand fleas that are usually tied to dogs and rodents, how can we prevent an infection? Okay, don't touch random dogs, especially if you know they're just like random dogs that just roam the streets, which there are lots of them. Um, in South and Central America. Um, don't play with all the dogs. Um, also, bug spray, I was gonna say, because these little sand fleas are not gonna wanna bite you if you're covered in um, your DEET. Third of our flagellated protozoans, this was the third, um, is Giardia intestinalis. Its name is gonna tell you exactly where this particular protozoan wants to go. It likes to hang out and develop, and it's like a full adult stage in the intestine. And when you are infected with a whole bunch of these organisms in your intestine, um, you have giardiasis. So they are found naturally in the intestinal tract of a lot of animals, and we find them out in the environment, in the cyst stage in water systems. So my little note, I was like, I like this picture because it's like, oh, refreshing clear water. But then you look up <laughs> upstream and it's like, well, what are you really drinking? 
And the interesting part about this particular uh, protozoan is that, because we pick it up by ingesting the cysts in contaminated water, sometimes food, but it's usually contaminated water, um, is that this particular cyst, when it's in watery systems, it is filter feeding in the watery systems, and it will actually make water systems look cleaner because it's filtering the water. So sometimes you're like, well, look, this is the cleanest water I've seen. I drink this stuff. Well, there might be a reason why it looks so clean. It's because it had a whole bunch of filter feeders that are living in there, and then you ingest them. Once they develop in the body, so you ingested these little cysts, they develop into the trophozoite stage, which are on one of my previous pictures too. These large, they're quite large. Uh, organisms. They look like they have two little eyes in them. They're not. Those are not eyes. I mean, these are still single-celled organisms. But they are little suction cup discs. So, just suction cup discs. So that they get into the intestinal tract and literally just attach right onto your intestinal wall lining. So this is an actual picture of a whole bunch of these Giardia. You can see the nice little flagella. They're using those little suction cup discs. And you can actually see the intestinal wall lining just a little bit in between some of these. So they will completely coat the intestinal wall lining to the point where like you can barely see anything. So depending on how many you have, it generally depends on your symptoms. So if you don't have too many, you might even be asymptomatic. Otherwise, it leads to severe gastrointestinal disease. You're gonna have severe diarrhea, sometimes bloody diarrhea, that's not as common, usually very mucousy, um, and Usually it's accompanied by a very distinct smell. So if you travel, because again, we generally see more cases of this in more um, or less developed countries and you're drinking random water. Um, and my note, the cysts, when you drink the water, one, they are filter feeding, but two, um, they are resistant to chlorine. So even putting chlorine tablets in water won't make a difference. Um, they're resistant to drying. So be like, oh, you know, even a dry anything, they'll still survive. Um, the only thing that they, the only way to get rid of them, if you know you're going to be camping somewhere or somewhere, you're going to have to drink the water, you can filter them out. The cysts are big enough that even a Brita filter will filter them out. But back to my, in the intestinal tract, they cause a diarrhea and a very distinct smell. As those Giardia are in the intestinal tract, and they are feeding, they're not, they're just attached to the intestinal tract. They're not feeding on the intestinal tract itself. They are feeding on whatever you are eating. As they are feeding and eating whatever you are, uh, they do produce a hydrogen sulfur or sulfide um, kind of product as they're breaking everything down. And what does that smell like? What does sulfur smell like? And eggs. And so if you go traveling somewhere and you're like, oh, I ate something or whatever and I have severe diarrhea. God, there's so many bacteria that could cause severe diarrhea when you travel. Um, but if you're like, but it's got a very rotten egg smell and it's very consistently rotten egg smell like all the time, most likely Giardia. Now, will it go away on its own? Yes, but it could take weeks for it to go away on its own. Um, so if you were traveling somewhere, you had a patient that traveled somewhere and they're like, oh, I've got severe diarrhea and I ate and drank some shady places um, and it smells like rotten eggs all the time, we've got some antiprotozoans that's gonna make it go away a whole lot faster. Your best prevention, just filter water. Again, Brita filters will get rid of the cyst stage and you don't have to worry about it. I was like, I did one travel trip down to South America and one of the, one of the guys on our group ended up developing this. Felt so bad because then he just had to stay in the hotel or the little hostel that we stayed at and everyone else went and did all the stuff. He just sat there, it sucked. What I get to today is our last of the flagellated protozoans. It's Trichomonas vaginalis. It is transmitted uh, via sex, so it is a sexually transmitted disease. Um, there are not very many parasites that are STDs. So it lives happily in the genital urinary system. So it can live in both the reproductive tract as well as the urinary tract. It's transmitted via sex, and the interesting part of it is there is no cyst form. It's just always a flagellated form. have the most symptoms that come from it are the ones that already have a pre-existing STD. So if you already are suffering from chlamydia or gonorrhea, this little parasite really likes to get in there because there's already some damage happening and this little parasite's like, sure, I'll live in here. It's like a big old party with everyone. 
Men are usually asymptomatic. Why is that an issue, though? They pass it on and have no idea that they are carriers of it. Women develop what's known as vaginosis. Again, this thing is going to live. It's going to cause damage to both uh, the vagina lining. It's going to be painful. Um, it's going to cause usually a very distinct bad smell. There's usually pus. It can get into the urinary system. It can live in the urine, cause painful urination. It's not fun. Nope, because that was just bacteria. <laughs> like, but if you have one, you can definitely have the other as well. But they would be treated different. You could give antibiotics for anything bacterial, but you'd have to take some type of antiprotozoan for this one. Now, how they diagnose it is they can take any type of just a fluid. They can just get a little bit of fluid um, from the vaginal tract. They can get, even get a little bit of urine and look at it underneath the microscope. They don't stain it at all. What they're looking for are these flagellated stages um, underneath the urine or underneath the microscope. I mean, if you look at some urine or a sample of uh, fluid from the, vag uh, the vaginal tract, you, should, you never want to see something swimming around. Um, I mean, it's pretty easy to diagnose it, just be like, uh, there's something single-celled, and it's flagellated because it's moving around like that. And it's like, oh, well, really the only one um, that causes diseases is this particular um, protozoan. So it is treatable. We do have antiprotozoans that can treat it that will make it go away faster. Otherwise, the immune system can get rid of it on its own. Um, best prevention, abstinence, safe sex can all decrease the spread of this particular uh, protozoan. We're going to end right there because I'm not going to get into the last group. Like the last, last group. The app, oops. <laughs>